We're joined, I think you've obviously seen everyone speak, um, apart from uh, one man who's uh, Jeremy Kopp, who's the Vice President of Telecoms from uh, Comscore. Uh, so Jeremy, thank you very much for, uh, for joining uh, our panel. And uh, I, will, I will start uh, with you, really, I think, um, to maybe give uh, your thoughts, and, and obviously from, from what you've seen um, at Comscore, really, on the situation with regard to telecom operators and big data, uh, particularly, I think, in, if we focus on, on, on the European perspective, if possible. What, what, what are you seeing out there that's happening? How, how long have we got? <coughs> um, that's a big question. So I think the presentations have covered it pretty well uh, to date. Um, uh, to try and summarise, the operators have all the data they need at the moment. Uh, it's typically siloed within the organisation. And, uh, you know, one of the key challenges I think your survey revealed is, you know, there are operational issues in terms of being able to bring the organization together to use all of that data. Um, it's not as if anyone's going to lose it and everyone's going to enjoy the benefit of it, but they, they need to collaborate uh, effectively to bring it all together. Um, I think uh, Richard had a great slide that kind of illustrates our approach to this solution in that uh, it, uh, bring, bring it together in a platform that's capable of ingesting all of these data sources, combining that with subscriber information, categorizing the whole lot, and then providing insights to the business. Um, another um, uh, thing I'll mention is that too many of uh, the customers we see, or the operators we see, are hung up on the buzzword big data. So there's an exec team who think they need a big data strategy but I have no idea what that is. So uh, my recommendation to the industry and to, to all here is to think about the business problems, the business questions, how do you want to uh, optimize your revenues and margins, reduce your costs, what are the key drivers of your business? Start from that as a perspective and then look at tools and software platforms that deliver insights to answer those questions. Don't even worry whether it's big data or not. Yeah, you, what you want is, is are the insights that drive your business forward. Um, and there will likely be big data solutions, but nobody really understands or cares whether it's a big data solution. right? You just want a tool, you want a platform that's going to efficiently give uh, the business users the answers they need to drive the business forward. Okay. Um, Andy, from, from, from the vendor side then on, on, on that point, is it your experience that the operators are have that position that Jeremy is very much talking about in, in, in that mindset of like, you know, this is uh, it's a business driver and it's what we need to do, this is what we want to do, and therefore can you can use a solution to, to build on top of that? Or, or are they, you know, again, from your experience, are they, are they still, not, still not at that point yet? I think, uh, well, I think it, it's not a universal view for all operators and it's not even a universal view within a given operator about, you know, how they're going to approach the uh, you know the, the use of uh, or, or monetization of, of the customer data. I think there's a general recognition across the whole industry that operators have got to do something to transform the business away from the old traditional way. But uh, not all operators have taken the you know come to the conclusion about the role of uh, you know you, and the way they will use their customer data in in doing that. Um, the innovative ones, I think, are experimenting uh, at this stage. It's you know the, it's not a mature market. Uh, and you know, with new technologies, the tools are there, uh, but there's a lot of rope to hang yourself. You can use the tools badly and get uh, you know the opposite effect from, of what you want. So I think we're in a phase of experimentation at the moment, and uh, we'll we'll begin to see what works, and uh, other operators will copy that. Can I just add one piece that I, I forgot to mention? Uh, again, the operators need to understand again, and I, I think Richard outlined this well, that that. Um, business analytics and, and big data strategies don't have to mean purely external monetization, selling data externally. The, uh, we think the opportunities are much greater just uh, improving the revenues, the margins uh, from their existing subscriber base. So first use the data you have about your subscribers internally. It'll help you understand the data much better and how you can use it. And then, yes, there might be a play to sell segments of that externally. Richard, I'll put you on the spot there on that then. Um, you obviously, you're, you're one of those operators that, that are doing both, um, external and, and internal. Is, is there a view that one is kind of a much bigger opportunity than the other, um, or, or are they both kind of equally important? Well, that's like the innovators, innovators dilemma, yeah? It's definitely, if you use it for internal, a 1% is in churn, is hundreds of millions, yeah? Uh, 
external monetization. Uh, I think the biggest revenues and operators in external monetization advertising. It's Fine. about 10 million, yeah. yeah. So definitely the, the big opportunity is in the traditional business because that's a big business. But I think operators, uh, some of them at least, or many of them are realizing we have to do something, otherwise we will become a network only company. Yeah? And some operators took that decision, yeah? like uh, KPN in the Netherlands. Okay, well, we do that and that's what we do well. Yeah? Others are, of course, more, uh, more ambitious and they want to reinvent themselves. Yeah? I sometimes say that in 2020, uh, Telefonica will be a, an information company and, and also sell some phones, yeah? but as a, as a side effect. Um, <coughs> uh, coming back to the first question, I do think we are in a different world in, in big data, thanks to the external monetization. But also if you look in the, in, the, in, in the history of operators and business intelligence, it has always been, give me the business case, tell me what data you need, and you get the money to build it, yeah? And then, uh, and I think big data, even though it's a hype, that has changed, yeah? So I think it went all the way the other way. It, it went all, all the other way, yeah, it said, forget about the business case, just make sure you get all the data, and then the business will come, yeah? Uh, there was the other end, that was the NoSQL part. Uh, was, uh, I think we, a few years ago we were still there. And I, I think that has worked to change the mindset, to get some new thinking going on in those large organizations. But of course, uh, I mean, I tried to do it myself, yeah? So they asked me to set up a big data or BI function. I said, okay, let's get all the data and give me some money and I'll do it. And they said, no, what for? Yeah? So in the end, you need to put some, some, some figures on, on top of it. But I think that, that's a big, that is a change, yeah? Otherwise, we would still be doing the same old-fashioned things as, as we did in the past. Um, Jean-Michel, on, on that sort of internal versus external question, what, what's, uh, what's your view? I think there's a, it's a very much depending on, a, as, a, as mentioned by, by Richard, a, a culture, a cultural view from, from the company. Um, to build, if it's, if the vision is coming from, from the top, obviously, they will have build up their, their massive platform. But currently, I believe there's still a lot of, uh, a lot of silos and a legacy system to consolidate an agreement on, on the vision, how we do it. And I think it's been maybe a halfway house. It's, it's, it's going to take a while to get to this big, big, uh, big data platform. And currently, people or managers need to indeed build a business case. So a recommendation will be here very much build up something, start small, and maybe uh, either do it internally if you think you can. But by the time all the communication is worked out and the agreement between the various um, departments is sorted out, maybe you can use some sort of outsource uh, and nibble very quick short projects to educate the management of the benefits. So you start small and build up the return and that basically will uh, evangelize, I would say, the, uh, the benefits that you have to suffer because the big shift, that will be quite uh, a, big, uh, a big challenge, I think, to convert everyone and say, okay, we've got to get rid of our legacy system, or like five or six or ten OSS, BSS system and building up. The banks started doing this 20 years ago, they're still managing their legacy system. So it will take a while. Yeah. George, is, is, is the industry moving quick enough on this, uh, on this, in this area, in your view? Um, I think, I, I, I would suggest if you talk to many operators, um, an awful lot of them would suggest that, um, that they're not using their data as well as it could be. Um, I think there are aspirations to become information driven companies, but I think when you, when you sort of look at what's happening, uh, I think an awful lot of decisions are still made on, um, on sort of past experience or, or sort of gut feel really. Um, and, uh, and I think sort of get, getting a hold of the data, the right data, and, and harnessing it to, to provide the insights required, and, and even more importantly, the action um, on the back of that insight is still is still something that a lot are striving for. Um, I, I I would suggest, um, and and I think you know the, the points about um, big data. I mean, I think it's been very helpful um, in in making people, particularly senior people in organisations, aware that there's sort of a, a data thing going on, um, but it's certainly not new. Um, and uh, you know there have been high volumes of data for a long time. It's just helped focus the mind. I, I would suggest. And interestingly, I think um, back in 19, I think it was 1954, um, the Institute of Electrical and Eng Electronic Engineering, which which at that point covered sort of computer science as well, um, was talking about the phenomenon of big data, uh, and they were concerned about uh, people creating too much. 
uh, and they, they had two solutions. One was to uh, constrain the amount of characters you could write, so I think it was about 50 characters, uh, or the other was just not record anything. Um, now clearly neither of those worked, but, but, but you know, it just illustrates that it's not a, you know, it's not, it's not a new problem at all. Um, it's, it's been around for some time, it's just you know, certain technologies and, and, and phrases have come into play that's focused the mind more. Um, Uri, we talked a lot about the, uh, the, the privacy part uh, this morning from, 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 from the vendor side. How, how big an issue uh, is, is this? And, you know, do, do, is there any suggestion that it could really kind of stop this progression uh, towards big data and what type of all to do with this data in, in, in its tracks? So I think how big of an issue we saw in the second presentation what happened in uh, Germany. And uh, I mean, these kind of things operators cannot uh, afford to happen. So. I don't think it will uh, stop uh, big data, but it's definitely one of the considerations operators uh, have to take in place. And uh, introducing uh, solutions for things such as permission to allow customers to indicate what type of information they allow the operators to collect, give them the control uh, to opt out and uh, cancel their concession to uh, use their data. I think all of these will have uh, to be put in place in order for big data really to uh, to catch up. One other point is the fact that we touched, touched a bit external versus internal. I think a lot of the um, data monetization, maybe not the revenue, but a lot of the focus and activities will be with uh, third uh, party uh, companies. So operators will be required to send data outside the network to partners, whether these are content providers, whether these are uh, partners that complete their complement their portfolio. So before this can happen on a wide scale, operators have to put in place uh, the right infrastructure to anonymize the data and ensure that it is safe to send the data uh, outside the network. Okay, thank you. Um, we have all your speakers here. Has anyone got any uh, questions for for our panel? Uh, yeah, I think we've got a, a mic coming around. Just like Manta uh, saying, here you are, where we come from. Uh, triggered by something that. Um, Andy gave in his example, in as much as OTT players are just as much customers as the end subscriber is uh, in terms of the revenue flow between the players in the value chain, it seems to me there's a potential sort of backdoor breach of net neutrality uh, that big data can provide here. Because uh, do Napster, for example, have an opt-out on the use of their data, as in who used their app? Because effectively, the telco was selling Napster's data to Spotify. I don't have no idea what the common practice is at the moment and how that works and whether commercial terms apply, and in particular whether they're differential, which is where the potential net neutrality bridge comes in, because the bigger players will have more leverage. Uh, I just wonder if the panels have got any experience of how this plays out in practice. So I think I can I can probably answer that from. Certainly, from Comscore's perspective, whose other part of business is measuring digital media interactions by consumers globally, so um, that information is free to see on the operator's network for the operator to use. Um, I'm not aware of there being ex explicit agreements as to how it's used, but clearly the media provider could think about obscuring the information if they got their heads around it. I don't know whether the operators have any views on that. Well, I think this is all DPI, uh, Depacted Inspection uh, Information, and that is uh, highly uh, controversial. So I think any operator at the moment is hands off. Uh, so we have a clear uh, policy. We don't do anything with that information. Uh, because you, you know what happened in the in the Netherlands with KPN, yeah. So the, the second. That, that's why I said it would be interesting to see if net neutrality actually gets extended into the domain of big data, specifically to well, deal with differentiation yeah, yeah, yeah. between OTT players uh, by the use of an anonymization of their data. I, I think that's too advanced yeah, for <laughs> for. Uh, Operate. So I, I, I do know that there is some things going on with DPI if you offer a service that requires it, like throttling yeah, is DPI stuff. So in some countries you can buy unlimited access to Facebook, but no access to anything else. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't do that without a, without a DPI. So if there is a very clear relation between uh, what you buy and that they need to control you, then it's okay. A anything else uh, is 
just you can't do it. I mean, things that they are doing in, in, in China is, is I mean, you can't even mention it. China. <laughs> you but, can't even. But I, I do want to make a remark on over the top, yeah, because this is this, so. This is a telco event, yeah. Uh, some telcos are way beyond others, but really, uh, the, our, the, competi the competition is not within the telco space. The competition is in an over-the-top world. Yeah? So for a very simple data proposition uh, in a telco, it can til still take you like uh, a year to do something because you need to get the data. The data is everywhere. It's not, exp it's not cheap. Yeah? So uh, look at uh, internet digital companies. They're built around data. Yeah? Google or LinkedIn, they can do like this and they have a new product. Yeah? It's all there. It's the business decision. In the telco, it's first the business decision and then you have to execute, which takes a long time. Yeah? So they might even think that the telco data is much richer than over-the-top data, but if you want to be quick, you may have to start over-the-top yourself to show the value without any investment. Eh? Uh, so it's a kind of paradox. Eh? In order to leverage your assets, you need to ignore them. <laughs> yeah? well, that's the situation uh, we, we're often in. And, and can I just yeah. make, turn, turning that <laughs> argument around, there is the case that for a service provider or a media owner, they actually want people to know how large their audience is and how many people are using it because that's what they trade on. So if you start hiding that or artificially reducing the view of your audience, then it may not be in your best interests. Okay, thank you. Got, anyone else got a, a question? Yep, one on the left there, Andrew's on the left. Um, it's interesting, you've all been talking about big data in, in, in mobile perspectives, you know, really looking at mobile churn and that kind of thing. One of the things that, that we know is coming is the sort of the phrase around Internet of Things, which is, you know, connected devices and to forecast saying 50 billion devices connected on, you know, on mobile networks probably. Um, wonder if you guys had any comments on that in terms of operating model and, and operating model, but also you know, business model on how you guys can get money in the back of it and therefore what you're doing, if anything. Um, George, I know you had a, a slide on uh, your presentation about M2M. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I did mention M2M. Um, and, and obviously there's been quite a lot of announcements recently uh, in the UK about, about that, specifically around some of the smart rating stuff. Um, I think, you know, from a from a big data perspective, that the, there will be opportunities to differentiate, I would imagine, um, from an analytics perspective. So actually, you know, if not only can you offer a connectivity between you know, cows or cars or whatever it is, um, but um, but actually off, offer a sort of value add on top of that, which which is an insight in the analytics and and you know whether that's that's real time or in batch or whatever. But I think that could be a, a real differentiator, and particularly, you know, if you can offer that service out the box rather than um, you know having the whichever customers are doing it themselves, I guess. Um, so that 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 would be a, a sort of good application of of, of big data uh, and big data analytics, really, from an MTM perspective. From a, um, a, a business analytics solutions perspective, there's there's nothing different in coping with M to M than coping with consumer data. It's it looks pretty much the same, uh, and you can identify different types of devices. And uh, I think uh, as you as you've raised, the the key is I identifying the the business drivers for that. Um, and you know, without oversimplifying it, it's probably easier to upsell consumers than it is to upsell a smart meter. So there's there's much more opportunity around getting consumers to buy more than there is to persuade a an energy provider to yeah. use more. Well, I know it was the Telefonica meter. literally in the last few weeks have signed that deal. Yeah, so um, I think so. Uh, machine to machine uh, is very close to our core business. Yeah, it's so the first step of machine to machine is just managed connectivity. It's rather instead of people, you have devices. Yeah. Uh, uh, so that's why for telcos it's much easier to move in that space because they understand it, they know how the business works, uh, you get much less per SIM, but you can sell ma many more SIMs. So, um, so there is just do as much as you can. Yeah? So we, I think we recently, a few days, we signed a contract with the UK government for, I don't know, one and a half billion for uh, smart meters uh, across, the, across the country here. Uh, <coughs> If you look at it from a big data perspective, that's part of the data strategy. Yeah? So we have our customer base now, uh, we have our customer data, 
and the next step is we got also all kinds of machines data yeah? and as technically it's not differently it's, it's maybe probably a bit more uh, but if you look at uh, today uh, so we launched in, in in Spain and I think it's soon to launch here is what we call in the insurance industry is pay as you drive yeah so you have a box in your car uh, it's an accelerometer uh, registers how you drive when where location uh, and the M2M part is it has a SIM and it sends the data yeah? to, um, to, to a server. Now, in, instead of, it's especially for young male people who tend to pay a lot, so you give them half of it, but they <coughs> sign up, okay. Uh, if you drive um, at night, uh, in the weekends, uh, in the city center, if you speed, if you make very rough, uh, harsh brakes, then all you start paying more. Yeah? So it's a completely new proposition. Uh, I've actually, you can see, well, people like it, but actually because they can see how they drive. I'm a good driver, I'm a bad driver. Of course, if there is a, the, the, there's part of money as attached to it, is, of course, they immediately, if, 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 if you let them pay them more, they yes, okay, show me what I did. Yeah? And then, of course, there is a different interpretation of what means a harsh brake or, or a quick acceleration. Uh, that's closer yeah, to, uh, to what's happening now, but... Um, I don't know how many business is there. Yeah? So it's a whole new space, uh, fleet management as well. I think to comment on, on this is very much uh, going back to the trust and then uh, to the dm 2 m is to make sure that the consumer do get the benefits of it, which is quite su surprising because on a, on a smart meter case, if you're an energy provider, the benefits for the consumer is spending less energy, <laughs> which is quite counterproductive. Actually, if you say okay, if you because who's paying for the for the meter, is the energy provider or the government? But to basically to, to spend less of your of your product, but there's a benefit to the consumer. Is that if you subscribe and opt in, we can give you recommendations so that how come you live in a house semi-detached, that many people, that many rooms, and spend 20% more than someone else in the same street, same climate, same amount of people who actually spend more, and then you can add value to the consumer. Say we can help you to save money. The same thing with, with the, 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 the car. It's a matter of education. And then you're becoming to one-to-one -one, uh, relationship between the consumer who get immediate benefit as opposed to uh, what will you use my data, will I get spam, and so on, so on, so on. Um, on, on this point, actually, in the, by the end of this year, in December 2013, people will be opt-out by default, similar to the German uh, uh, model. They won't be opt-in. So that's, that's, those things will help, I believe, to, uh, to have a, an understanding of where the data can benefit the individual themselves. And I think if the telco take that curve, that, uh, that uh, crossroad, pretty well, they can build and maintain that, that trust so that people can get the benefit of it. If they don't see the benefit and they'll see all of it to be traded and, and then people track me and so on, that's a different, uh, different game, I think, a different story. Any more, any more questions for panel? Yep. Stuck on waiting for the uh, mic to just pick your voice. <coughs> My question for uh, Yuri and, and Andy. Um, you're, as it were, I hesitate to use the word exploiting um, mobile or cellular <coughs> data. Um, do you, do you, how do you think, uh, or is there a benefit for the, the operators in terms of having access to the same real time Wi Fi data if they could get hold of it? Mm. Mm. Um, well, actually, an example from China Mobile, they also they have their carrier Wi-Fi network as well. And one of the the key things about the solution is that they they know it's the same customer whether they're on the mobile network or the Wi-Fi network. And particularly when operators are trying to offload uh, data traffic onto Wi-Fi, you know, often when you offload the you know the uh, the data, you offload the customer as well. You've you know lost lost track of them. Uh, but in this case, you don't. You know, you can actually keep uh, you know keep associate the uh, still identify as the same customer, and uh, so there is a lot of value, I think, in being able to go across different types of network. Yeah. And how, how do you identify the same customer? Uh, so the technical solution is that um, it connects to the radius server, which uh, provides a, a correlation between the um, uh, the customer ID on the Wi-Fi network and the uh, the IMSI, Apparently, I, I can I can add some experience so, to that as well in that. Yeah. Uh, we're able to look at um, all consumers and their behaviors regardless of connection mechanisms. So we actually see um, on and off network 
uh, usage, so Wi-Fi usage as well as mobile network usage. And there are, as Andy says, there are techniques where you can connect the two and so provide a data set to a network operator to be able to look at their Wi-Fi behaviours of their subscribers as well as... Is that uh, real time or batch? Yeah, that's real time. Um, and uh, I'd just I'll throw out a stat there, here in the UK, and it's certainly true of most of uh, the developed European countries, about 66% of uh, page views are off network for mobile subscribers. So two thirds of the behaviours are invisible to the network operators. Mm -hmm. Uri, did you want to? Um, yeah, I mean, just on the, on the Wi-Fi part, so obviously in order to benefit from that, the operator would have to offer a Wi-Fi service. So you can't just access public Wi-Fi and get this information. So that's first point. Um, second, yeah, I mean, the more information you have, it gives you a complete picture, especially with these figures of Wi-Fi yeah, usage. But um, and as touched by the panel, I think it's all down to the what exactly you want to achieve with the data. And uh, obviously you want as much as possible. Do you really need it? I mean, will you really use it? Is it worth uh, collecting this information? Will you benefit from it? So I think there's a lot of... Um, I mean, the technology is running quite quickly, I think faster than the business in respect uh, to big data. And I think marketing, at least the way we see it in the next year or two, will start to put their stamp and define what exactly it is that they want to do with the data, which will sort of bring more sense to what we try to do, what we want to achieve, how much is it worth to invest, and so on. And, and a, a use case for that type of data set is in an operator deciding on a Wi-Fi strategy or if they already have a Wi-Fi strategy and Wi-Fi service, being able to identify their consumers uh, that are connecting to competitor services and offer them upsell with a bundled package to their own service. So being able to see that uh, behavior has value today. So. I, th I think you should distinguish between uh, public Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi at home. Yeah? So if you say 66% is Wi-Fi, yep. I guess a large part of that is from it the sofa. Yeah, it can be, at, at and home. from and which from can be from right. the same yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. provider. Yeah. We, we 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 just recently launched actually our um, our uh, mobile consumer survey, and that showed the attempt that sixty percent of smartphone users used Wi-Fi on the move. Yeah, so it's so not 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 just okay. at the home. So sixty percent of them were actually using public Wi-Fi. To your point. Okay. Any more questions from uh, from our audience? Yep. Uh, hi, uh, Krista, um, Times PLC. It's a uh, uh, question towards uh, Robert. Robert Redford, that is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with reference to privacy and uh, the sale of data generally, um, and you say you're protecting it if it's encrypted. But if you now thought, therefore, have then the encrypted key in your third party and they have a breach, does the responsibility sit with them as a third party or does it come back to haunt you? Well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so just make sure I understand clearly the question that we had a case where the data is encrypted and uh, for the person has a breach and the hackers have the key to encrypt the data. Oh, wow. It's a kind of, uh, it's mean that you've been very, very targeted as a, as a, as a hack. The, the law says that if the data is un unintelligible by anyone, uh, who's not authorized to access the data. So I guess you'll have to demonstrate that the person uh, actually can make the data in, uh, intelligible, decrypt the data, and the data, the person was authorized. So it's a bit of a loophole, basically, in the regulation, because <laughs> you have to say that <coughs> the data it can't be understood by someone who's not authorized. Providing you don't authorize your hacker to it, you don't have to report it. I'm sure they will, through, uh, through experience, the loophole will, will get uh, good cover. Just uh, to add on top of that, I think there are two things here. First of all is the law or the regulation, and the second thing is the customer, uh, uh, let's say, perception or trust in the mobile operator. So even if the law covers the mobile operator, the damage is done. And if the data is hacked, the operator is in a position where he needs to provide explanation, and uh, stand behind the law, but the perception or the damage is already done. So I think the way forward is for operators as part of the strategy to implement in their network a solution that will send the data anonymized uh, to third parties 
rather than rely or trust third parties to do that themselves. And, and I just want to say something because... Paul Newman. Paul Newman. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was reading that in the early uh, 17th century in this country, uh, English people opposed the census because they said it was taking liberty away from them. And I'm just thinking in, in advance, we don't know what's going to happen with privacy and how we feel about our data. We were talking about this in the break. Maybe in the f next 10 years, we'll just say, well, you know, they have my information. We don't know what's going to come. Um, 300 years ago, a census was considered, oh, you know, this is not, this is infringing about uh, uh, my personal liberties. Now we're thinking, I mean, I personally do not even buy the Oyster card. <laughs> That's says more about my mental uh, situation than anything else. But maybe in 20 years, everybody will say, well, they have my information. We don't know. Um, uh, the laws are just coping with what we feel at the moment. And I think, uh, you know, things are going to change. Mark, well, I just come back? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, back to Yuri again. Thank, thank you for the answer for that, because uh, I kind of anticipated that you might say that. Um, <laughs> Happy I met the expectations. <laughs> now comes the... <laughs> I knew I should have kept quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Let's wait and see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What I was going to counter with is it depends upon the, the damage created from a breach and the pursuit could actually be greater than the potential benefit in having the data in the first place and then trying to exploit its potential. Mm. <laughs> well, actually, yes. Um, uh, in my in my experience in, in, in Telefonica, uh, that uh, trade-off has been made all the time over the past years. I mean, there have been many discussions on mobile advertising. What can you do? What can't you do? How much opt-in? I mean, in mobile advertising with opt-in is five percent of your customer base. It does, that is not a business. So uh, a lot of CEOs have taken taken a decision. Okay, if we want to go up, we need to go uh, and opt out. Uh, how much money does it give? What is the potential uh, damage for the reputation? So we don't do it. Yeah? That's, that's one of the problems why the telco industry is moving, moving so slowly because traditionally uh, the brand is uh, very much protected against anything that can go against it. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> I think uh, you made a remark that there's a difference between uh, what legal is okay and what society or what people accept. I think that's actually the case because I think there is no uh, company uh, in general, a uh, well-respected company or telco in the world that is not respecting the legal situation. Yeah? And still there are many backlashes uh, because it's society who decides whether or not uh, you, you can do it or not. And that's something that, that we have to live with. Uh, anonymous data, um, encrypted data, well, the law doesn't speak about anonymous data. The law speaks about when you cannot re-identify eh, a person. Now, if you have anonymous data, you all know the case studies, many where people release anonymized data and within a few hours people pin down a few people yeah. eh, who were supposed to be anonymous. So it's not about uh, anonymous data. So you can't say we need to send anonymous data over the network. No, anonymous data uh, can become uh, personal data in different in a certain context. Yeah? Uh, I don't know because there are simply a few people uh, in that area who have that disease. Yeah? So you can just pin down uh, that person. So it's about the possibility to re-identify a person, and that makes it anonymous or not. And, and you can't give a guarantee. It's impossible. Yeah? And I think one of the the first people uh, organizations who made public statement. On this was the uh, information uh, commissioner in, in, in the UK here who wrote a report or a, a sort of guidance, a best practice guide. If you want to monetize data externally, do it anonymously. And what does that mean? Yeah, concrete steps. Because he said, if 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 you ha you have a breach and you can show me that you've done this this and this and this, then I will not find you. Yeah? Uh, so, but you need to think about it. And then if you look at the history of the scandals, uh, in many of the companies that are suffering scandals, they have no legal or security problem at all. It's just somebody who says something and it lives its own life, and then whatever their policy is, even if it was perfect, they have to make a statement. Yeah? Uh, <coughs> so it's, it's not so black and white, yeah? and, and there are no things 
you can <laughs> guarantee that you will not have problems w w whatsoever. Yeah? So I think uh, society is very important. But then also, I mean, how much, how many clients lost uh, Sony with the PlayStation breach? Uh, Vodafone, two million customers affected in Germany. How much business have they lost? Maybe they haven't lost anything. I, I do think it's interesting. I mean, I, I think sort of Vodafone was kind of in Germany was, was the first one, but literally in the, the ten days that has followed that, <coughs> we've had Belcom come out and say they were hacked internally. We've had Swisscom come out and said four internal data tapes were handed over to a national newspaper in Switzerland. I, I don't know whether they just come out because Vodafone mm -hmm. Germany's come out and it's a bit of an issue, or whether you know suddenly all the targets are being targeted, you know, because they they've seen it can be done. Uh, do, do you feel we're sort of on a little bit of a tip of an iceberg with this, um, with regards to telcos and their security and, and, and the data that they hold? I don't know. I don't know. What I do know, it's not so clear that if you have a data breach, uh, you will actually lose a lot of clients. Mm -hmm. Nobody, I mean, it's not nobody knows. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's very much how you position, how you communicate with your customers, and that's where, coming back to uh, data governance, if the, the problem has been thought through and said, so, okay, we, we know we'll get hacked, it's not, it's not if it's when, because everybody gets hacked and nobody can protect against hackers, but how you handle and if you have a, a crisis management policy, or if you manage that relationship, then I think you can do a damage limitation. What you don't want is a whistleblower or a, a, a watchdog or, or a, a consumer advocacy group taking it over, then, then you lose control, and then it's not out of the box. You can't put the lead back on. I'd like to say a big thank you to, to all our speakers today for their presentations. Much appreciated. Um, we'd like to thank you for coming as well, obviously. Um, if uh, so the presentations will be, all the videos will be online uh, within the next week. Um, if you haven't taken a, a magazine with all the big data um, special report that we've done, uh, please do so. Um, and we'd love to welcome you again to, to our next event, which is actually on managed services uh, at the beginning of next year. So thank you all very much to our panel, first of all. Thank you. Thank you.